30 years ago in 1993, beta-seron, beta-interferon 1b, was FDA-approved for multiple sclerosis, and we began the treatment era for MS. To imagine, there was no standard treatment prior to this. Sure, there was cyclophosphamide, steroids for relapses, other off-label uses of medication, azathioprine, but really no standard, well-marketed, widely used treatment. So what is MS like in the treatment era? What have we learned? How has it changed? And where do we go from here? I found this excellent article in SAGE on this exact topic, MS Becomes a Treatable disease 30 years later. It's by Dr. Stephen Krieger and Dr. Fred Lublin from Mount Sinai. So Dr. Krieger is very active on neuro Twitter. He's a known academic. And Dr. Fred Lublin is an older neurologist who's been around for a long time, had a tremendous career, and was in the room for many of the modern advances of multiple sclerosis diagnosis and therapy. Let's see what they can teach us, and I'll make my own comments. 30 years ago, the first disease-modifying therapy for relapsing MS was approved for the use in the United States and soon thereafter across the globe. Since then, the field of MS therapeutics and studies of immunopathogenesis and genetics have advanced our understanding of the disease and raised the hope of better addressing the next challenges of treating progressive disease, enhancing repair of the damaged nervous system, and hopefully of a cure. 30 years into the MS treatment era, the field continues to debate fundamental aspects of MS, and there exists a widening chasm between the triumphs in relapsing disease and the desolation of MS progression, which remains the principal unmet need. And I have to say, as a clinician, this rings true. We have a lot of patients with MS who do exceptionally well. People are stable for decades, some of whom wouldn't have done well without disease-modifying therapy. Yet we get the sense for many people with MS, particularly people with progressive MS who maybe are still progressing despite using disease-modifying therapies or having significant side effects from them, maybe we're not helping them nearly as much as we should. Don't get me wrong, there are treatments of progressive MS and there have been some advances, just not to the same degree, at least not for everyone with MS. In this personal viewpoint, we outline lessons learned from the first era of great therapeutic development as we look into the future of MS research and therapeutics. The year 2023, marks the 30th anniversary of the first approved disease-modifying therapy for MS. This followed the first clearly successful outcome of a pivotal phase 3 trial utilizing interferon beta-1b and subsequent approval from the U.S. FDA. Having a first approved DMT was a seminal event for the field of MS and the larger arena of neurotherapeutics, a field that in 1993 was in need of successes after many unsuccessful attempts in the 1980s, which nevertheless informed our study design planning. And so we think of the plethora of treatments available for MS. Sometimes we forget that there were so many failures. Even drugs we know today to be high efficacy, like cyclophosphamide, cytoxin, didn't really have great evidence in their randomized trials. Some treatments were even ineffective, like gamma interferons, which made MS worse. And we really take it for granted that it's very difficult to get a successful drug on the market. One of us, Lublin, participated in the development of moving interferon through phase two, and then the pivotal study, the phase three study utilizing better understanding of the need for a more homogeneous study population employing new metrics and for the first time using MRI as a measure of success. For this author, this remains the single most exciting event of my professional career. So Lublin is stating when beta serum came onto the market and suddenly we had something to offer instead of just essentially experimental or unproven treatments, it was really exciting. And we think of beta serum as being such a bad, undesirable medication. Who wants to do injections? 
but at the time, it was revolutionary. The immediate consequences were several. For patients, great excitement and hope, as there were now strategies for treating this disease. For MS-treating neurologists, there was a new therapeutic area and heightened interest in the field of neuroimmunology. For basic researchers, there were new avenues to pursue to understand the mechanisms at play in treating MS with interferon, initially thought to be due to interferon's antiviral properties, later felt to be due to immunomodulation, and late me, maybe back to antiviral properties. I think they're referring to the activity of Epstein-Barr virus and the renewed understanding of its pathogenesis in MS. For clinical researchers, there was a better understanding of how to design and implement clinical trials for diseases like MS and how to work with regulators for licensing approvals. Prior to 1993, there was little interest in MS from pharmaceutical biotech companies based on the absence of any successful clinical trials and perceived inadequate understanding on how to perform MS clinical trials, a situation that has changed dramatically since 1993 on the principle that nothing succeeds like success. And we take it for granted right now, we imagine that pharmaceutical companies have this opportunity to make billions and they're often criticized for this. But imagine there was a time when pharmaceutical companies may have thought to themselves, you can't make any money in MS, there are no approved products, you'll never get a drug to market, it's just too hard to treat MS. That was the landscape at the time and we really take it for granted and it really is revolutionary for people to believe for doctors for industry for people with ms to believe this is a treatable disease there were also some unintended consequences the lottery for access to interferon beta 1b at launch caused considerable dismay. So for those who don't know, beta serin was approved in 1993, and of course everyone wanted it at the time, but it was very difficult to get and there was limited product, and so they literally had a lottery. You had to get lucky just to get the drug. People were begging for it. Of course now it's a drug that a lot of people with different options don't want at all. Kind of funny to think about, but that's how it was at the time. With the development of other interferons came the interferon wars of the late 1990s. And so you had Rebif, you had Extavia, which is identical to beta serin. You had Avinex. Later on, much later, you had Plegrity, all kind of competing with each other, saying we're the best drug, the most convenient, the most effective, and you had some head-to-head -head trials. The high expense for the drugs and new associations with pharmaceutical biotechnology company for better or for worse. And you invited in this area where suddenly doctors, MS neurologists were getting paid to give drug talks and they were making money doing it and having all these conflicts of interest, yet also spreading ideas about how properly to use these medications, as they say, for better or for worse. MS becoming a treatable disease spurred initiatives to better characterize the disease courses of MS and to develop guidelines for diagnosing MS. Imagine, who cares about proper diagnosis if there's no treatment anyway? But it became much more important to diagnose MS as early as possible and to diagnose it accurately if you were actually going to treat it effectively. No one wants to give a medication unnecessarily, and no one wants to give a medication too early in someone who may not go on to develop clinically definite MS. There also followed new initiatives in understanding the mechanism of actions of the new agents and how to improve them. Often this involved reverse engineering successful clinical trials to determine how the tested agent actually worked. International collaborations rapidly developed such that there was a worldwide effort at studying MS and broader aspects of human neuroimmunology, including improved clinical trial design. And we take it for granted modern phase three trials are really excellent. They produce these beautiful graphs. They have relatively good retention. They have good blinding. That wasn't always the case. There are all kinds of weird features of some of the older trials. 30 years on from the first injectable DMT, MS stands as an exemplar of advancements in neurotherapeutics, with over two dozen approved DMTs for relapsing MS, exploiting multiple mechanisms of action and routes of administration, a field where clinical trial failures rather than successes 
are the notable exceptions. The citation number two is liquinamide, a drug that got tremendous hype but ended up being not very effective and never became FDA or EMA approved for MS. So again, we forget about the tremendous trash heap of failed therapeutics. We only think about the successes. In relapsing MS, rather than despair at the absence of treatments, we now debate optimal treatment strategies, induction versus escalation. So should we hit people hard and aggressively, giving them the strongest agent, or should we be more conservative, give drugs with less side effects, and only if the individual has a relapse, new MRI lesion, or disability progression, should we give them the stronger agents? And personalized medicine. We have set the bar of success even higher from a watch and wait approach towards no evidence of disease activity and beyond. So any DA, no relapses, no new MRI lesions, no disability progression. But there's also beyond that. What about normalization of serum neurofilament light chain? What about normalization of the rate of brain atrophy? We're stricter and stricter on what we would like to achieve. Of course, much of this is in theory because we really don't have a good biomarker. Neurofilament light chain is too variable, in my opinion, for use in an individual. And even some of the quantitative MRI may not be that actionable for most clinicians in most situations. Advances in MS therapies led to a generation of neurologists to truly grapple with risks and benefits. Progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, the carry in the coal mine. This is the rare infection caused by the JC virus, mostly associated with Tysabri and forced MS neurologists to become not just skilled diagnosticians, but skilled tacticians in equal measure. The MS therapeutic armamentarium expanded concurrently with paternalism giving way to shared decision-making, expert opinion making room for lived experience. And so things have changed where we have a lot more to offer people. Back in the day, it may have been you have a diagnosis of multiple sclerosis, you have the option of beta seron and that's it, or maybe beta seron or carpaxone and Avonex, for instance. But now we have a lot more options and things with different side effects. And so we really have to discuss with people the risks and benefits because these are very different drugs with very different efficacy and safety profiles. 30 years into being able to treat our MS patients, there remains a great deal we have and still can learn from each other. Even in the process of determining who has or doesn't have MS has been transformed. Our diagnostic criteria have grown increasingly sensitive, allowing us to diagnose MS ever earlier. With an increasing awareness of disease below the clinical threshold, at the clinically isolated syndrome, radiologically isolated syndrome, and even in the prodrome of MS. Some people have subtle symptoms. They wouldn't necessarily meet the diagnostic criteria of MS, but retrospectively, they were likely early signs of the disease. A moving front of early detection and disease modification, all but unimaginable at the dawn of the MS treatment era and the determination that MS is best treated as early as possible. However, let's not get ahead of ourselves. 30 years into the treatment era, we still wrestle with and debate the fundamentals of this disease. Is MS an inside-out or an outside-in process? In other words, is the immune system in the periphery getting confused, entering the central nervous system and attacking, and the main problem is in reality the immune system, or is there something in the central nervous system itself or the blood vessels? For instance, in animal models, the neurotoxin cuprazone can induce demyelination and the inflammation from the immune system is a secondary process. My personal opinion is that the overall evidence suggests more of an outside in process. In other words, the immune system is the primary pathology. A T cell disease or a B cell disease. Historically, we thought T cells are the majority of the lymphocytes within the lesions. It must be a T cell disease, but we now know that B cells are very important in initiating inflammation in multiple sclerosis. They're antigen presenting cells, not just antibody producing cells, and we know that B cell depleting agents are surprisingly effective. People take for granted that people didn't think rituximab would work in the early 2000s until the clinical trials at the University of California, San Francisco, 
the Hermes and Olympus trials proved it is effective. What is the central nervous system molecular target, and can we develop antigen-specific targeted therapies? Do progressive mechanisms start smoldering even before relapses begin? There's this idea that maybe there isn't such a clear distinction between relapsing MS and progressive MS. Maybe there's low level of inflammation within stable old lesions that may be driving a subtle subclinical progression in all people, or at least most people with MS, regardless of whether or not they have progressive MS. Is MS caused by a viral infection? After all, there's increasing evidence that EBV is not just associated with MS, but may be part of the cause. How could we have accomplished so much and still have such foundational questions remaining unanswered? Even as we celebrate the successes in studying and treating relapsing MS, the principal unmet therapeutic need today can be summarized in two words disease progression. How can we stop that slow, insidious, subtle progression that occurs in many people overtly, but maybe also many others covertly driving slow worsening, setting people up for problems many decades later, even in early relapsing MS? It is the best of times and still the worst. For the patient in the clinic with early relapsing MS, the treatment opportunities are numerous and the prognosis optimistic. For the patient with advanced progressive MS, all of those vaunted successes fall away, and it is almost like 30 years all over again. I couldn't, wouldn't quite say that. Certainly, we have better symptomatic treatments. Sometimes we th have things to offer, but they aren't as proven and may not be as effective. And in some people, they may be completely ineffective. I'm referring to disease-modifying therapies. We must focus our attention and research efforts on the widening chasm. Both mechanistic understanding and treatment efficacy between these triumphs in relapsing MS and the desolation of MS progression, which still remains largely beyond our grasp. It is essential to point out that there is also a second chasm in the global MS community operating at the level of resource distribution and health equity. Due to their high cost, MS DMTs have been particularly subject to inconsistent and unequal distribution, and the great progress in the treatment of relapsing MS has unfortunately largely benefited those living in high-income countries. The international increase in MS prevalence and recognition documented by the Atlas of MS Project also highlights the development of effective therapeutics is but one step in ensuring improved outcomes for all people living with this disease around the world. The global MS community should take the lead in ensuring that these therapies reach affected individuals regardless of whether they live in a lower middle income country or in a high income setting that no one with MS should be forced to live in a perennial pre-treatment era. And this is something we take for granted. I get comments on my YouTube videos that I live in this and this country and I can't get access to treatment. It's a huge problem. 30 years on, what can we learn now from the first great era of MS therapeutic development as we look to the future? As was true then, we must draw from the advancements in immunopathogenesis, clinical assessment, and trial design to envision the roadmap towards conquering progressive disease. Advances in neuroimaging through emerging MRI techniques will continue to inform how we assess the full burden of MS disease, though when one considers the detailed realism of brain MRI that has been achieved in the past decades, <coughs> the continued woeful inadequacy of spinal cord imaging arguably the most prognostically significant region for physical disability becomes much more apparent. As was true then, we will still need an apt conceptual framework through which to view the problem at hand, where the disease phenotypes guarded, guided the inclusion criteria that allowed early successes in treating relapsing disease in the 1990s we have in recent years reconceptualized the disease to be an interplay of focal and diffuse inflammatory processes. So what you may not know is a lot of the early successes in relapsing MS trials were driven by the division of multiple sclerosis into categories, relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis, secondary progressive MS, primary progressive MS, and of course that helps for clinical trials. 
because you can try to include people who are most likely to benefit from the therapy. However, in modern times, we realize that relapsing MS and progressive MS are often occurring in the same person and to different degrees. And a lot of these divisions are very arbitrary. I think the evidence is that very strong that secondary progressive MS and primary progressive MS are the same disease. So maybe we have to change back to an all-inclusive view of the disease and widen who can get in to modern clinical trials. Of relapse and progression and of relapse-associated worsening, RAW, and progression independent of relapse activity, a disease continuum furthering this unified view of disease course. One of us, Krieger, developed the topographical model of MS, a reconceptualization of disease course that animates dynamically across the clinical phenotypes by depicting the specific relationship between subclinical lesion localization and the incremental loss of compensatory reserve. So this is the idea that if you have damage to your spinal cord or optic nerve, you have relatively little functional reserve and you tend to develop clinical symptoms right away. Whereas injury to the cerebellum and cerebrum may allow a greater cognitive reserve or reserve, and you may develop symptoms many years down the line. But that doesn't change the fact that CNS injury can be occurring all the time, even if it isn't overtly manifest. The recognition that progressive disease mechanisms and the loss of neurological reserve began early has substantial implications for the development of next-generation therapies. While it remains a matter of debate if MS is best considered one disease or individual phenotypes, the move to unify MS as a single disease entity is not intrinsically at odds with the notion that MS remains phenotypically diverse, a profoundly individualized and heterogeneous spectrum. In other words, saying that MS is pathogenically similar in people with very different symptoms does not change the fact that people's symptoms and experiences with MS are very different. The point is that the underlying mechanism of disease tends to be fairly similar. As we have gained robust control over relapses and disease activity, it is paramount that our assessments, clinical imaging, and fluid biomarkers become ever more sensitive to insidious progression. Sophisticated measures of neurological reserve will play an essential adjunct to designing progressive MS trials, unraveling the pathomechanism of progression will be the key to engineering new therapeutic agents. We need big data and small molecules. Now, right now, we're going down certain directions. For instance, the Bruton's tyrosine kinase inhibitors may target smoldering inflammation driven by innate immune cells, and that may help some people, but it may not help everyone. We need to better understand what is driving progressive multiple sclerosis. And it may be the case that Bruton's tyrosine kinase inhibitors aren't as effective as we think they're going to be, it remains to be seen. Where the field of MS stands 30 years into the treatment era and the enduring impact of our successes to date can perhaps be best summarized in the paradox of benign MS. We continue to debate if such an entity exists. On the contrary, historical definitions of benign MS allowed for an accumulation of disability up to EDSS-3, now this level of disability accumulated during a young adulthood would hardly be considered benign. So EDSS expanded disability status scale is a measure of disability in MS used in clinical trials, and three would be considered a modest amount of disability, and yet people can have significant pain, fatigue, cognitive dysfunction, difficulty walking very long distance, for instance, and if you're young and you have an EDSS of three, what's going to happen 20 to 30 years later? So so older neurologists back in the day were naive to think this was reassuring. Now we have a stricter definition of what disease control means. Furthermore, with the more refined approach to clinical assessments of disease burden, we increasingly recognize the layers of neurologic dysfunction that we previously missed, ignored, or underassessed, including fatigue, cognitive dysfunction, word-finding difficulty, depression, pain, loss of stamina, and loss of vocational ability, a litany of symptoms and signs that low scores on the EDSS fail to reflect, and as you know, I've criticized the EDSS 
in the past. And of course, it doesn't measure this invisible disability very well. And we have to use new tests like symbol digit modalities tests and the PACET as measures of cognitive function in modern clinical trials. Those who would have been considered as having benign MS in the past would no longer be considered as such now. I agree. Thus, we rarely use the term so not as to overpromise and to acknowledge that what is or isn't benign is perhaps not a clinician's or scientist's judgment to make. On the contrary, clinicians caring for people with MS universally recognize the profound benefits on clinical course that three decades of increasingly effective DMTs have wrought. Vastly more people being diagnosed with MS in the current era are destined to live lives significantly less affected by the disease, have a more stable disease trajectory, and accumulate far less disability than in the past. This is true. There's very strong evidence that MS is becoming milder on average. I would add that this isn't necessarily entirely due to the effects of disease-modifying therapies. Part of it may be that we're better at diagnosing milder MS and the diagnostic criteria have changed. And there's also a lead time bias if you're diagnosing MS a little bit earlier. The paradox is that 30 years on from the first successful MS clinical trial, benign MS is both less common and more common. So less common in the sense that we're recognizing these mild symptoms than ever before. However, there remains work to be done. So I thought this was a great article, and I think they really summarized the treatment era. And it was great to hear from Lublin, who has experience and lived this entire thing firsthand, during much of which I was a wee lad. And I do think we've made a lot of progress. I remember when I was training as a resident and a fellow. I was a resident between 2009 and 2013, and I was a fellow for a year and a half after that. You know, we would get second opinion consults, and people would be in poor shape, young people with a severe relapse, we'd be admitting to the hospital, doing plasmapheresis, and the game has really changed. We really have made people much more stable, but on the other hand, there's still some people with progressive multiple sclerosis, some of whom simply don't seem to respond well to disease-modifying therapy, so we have a long way to go. So I'd be interested to know, for those of you who have had MS for a while, who have lived through much of the treatment era, maybe even some of whom who lived and had MS prior to the treatment era, does this article ring true? Does it fit with your experience? It says, how has MS changed over the last 30 years in your experience, both in terms of how you were seen by your doctors, how you were treated? What did you think about the medications when they first came out? And do you have any suggestions for future videos?